Hello, and welcome to the Hero Report podcast. My name is Ari Cohen. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Nebraska, and with me, as always, from down under, Matt Langdon of the Hero Construction Company, uh, waking up early on a Saturday morning um, mm-hmm. to to uh, to be with us on the Hero Report. He uh, he is a hardworking man, uh, even on the weekends. Matt, how are you? I'm um, well, thank you. <laughs> Good, good. You seem you seem not to be delayed, uh, which is good. That's a good change. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also with us uh, today, um, for for she and I, it's Friday. For Matt, it's Saturday. So mm-hmm. this will be fun. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, is is Elizabeth Svoboda? Um, how are you? I'm good. Thank you guys for for having me on. Look, looking forward to talking with you. Absolutely. This is your uh, this is your second. Hero Report yeah. podcast, is that right? Yeah, second appearance. I think the last time was on, it was before we had the first Hero Roundtable, so a lot, a lot of water under the bridge since then, so looking forward to catching up on everything. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, welcome back. We're uh, always happy to have people uh, who are not um, uh, shy about coming back on. Uh, that means we mm-hmm. haven't um, alienated or offended um, at least more than uh, normal or necessary. Uh, so um, glad to have you back, Elizabeth. Um, so Matt, um, since, uh, since I know you're, um, you're uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed uh, over there this morning, what's on our agenda for today? Well, I would, uh, I've got, <clears throat> well, let me, let me frame this, I suppose. For the last, uh, I'd say, three weeks, we've had a lot of uh, bushfires all through this region. Um, so uh, the, the first wave of it, my, I, I was on the other side of the state away from all the fires while my wife, newly uh, living in Australia in country Victoria, was uh, by herself and had never experienced anything like this before. She had to evacuate. Um, so what what we've seen in this sort of small town is uh, all sorts of uh, firefighting people and, and trucks and, and all sorts of smoke. And um, what, what struck me was we've talked on the show before about uh, heroism of, of uh, people in the, doing their jobs, that, that there's this duty-bound idea that, well, maybe a firefighter is not a hero because that's their job and they're, they're getting paid for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the, the difference uh, that I want to discuss here is that most of, an overwhelming majority of um, the people fighting the fires here are volunteers. They just drop, uh, you know, drop whatever they're doing and uh, report <clears throat> to go and fight the fires. Um, you know, there's a small motel here uh, in town and it was filled with volunteers from around the state who had come to the area to fight the fires. So I thought, you know, we could start with that question of, is this still duty bound? Uh, well, is the fact that they are firefighters um, a, a, a detraction at all in in the the heroism of risking a life to fight fires? And does the idea of money come into it coming into it uh, affect our ideas of whether something's heroic or not? So. You might. It, there's a big difference between being paid to run into a burning building and volunteering to fight a, an out of control wildfire. Um, so I wonder what you guys thought about that. Well, I think in, in a way, um, because they're not getting paid, it, it makes it kind of all the more awe-inspiring, right? Because they truly are not expecting anything in return for what they they do. I mean, they've internalized this idea that they're going to put other people's lives ahead of their own. They've taken that on um, to to such a degree that they're willing to put themselves on the line like that without even any pay. And just like, I think, firefighters who are getting paid, they probably, if you ask them, they would say, well, I I don't see myself as a hero. I'm, I'm just doing my job. And that really that seems to be a common denominator among almost all of the the real life heroes that that I've talked to just that they're doing their job like I, I'm not doing anything special even though I think that they are doing special things but they truly are doing what they feel is the most decent and the most human thing to do in that particular situation so truly I, I'm in awe of these volunteer firefighters that put it all out there and 
you know, don't necessarily get anything tangible back for their efforts. Yeah, it's in, there's as as we we're just talking about it. I'm, I'm remembering that uh, all the uh, surf lifesavers in uh, Australia lifeguards are all volunteer as well. Um, mm -hmm. Comparing with the Baywatch style uh, you know, p professionals who are who are life you know guarding the beaches, they're all volunteers here too, and and certainly um, swimming into the ocean to rescue someone who's drowning is is putting your life at risk every time because you just don't know whether they're going to drag you down, what, what they're trapped in, all that sort of thing. So right. um, it's an interesting cultural difference, I suppose. Yeah, so Matt, explain this to me um, because, as you know, I'm um, interested in all things that happen in Australia um, and I don't understand many of those things. Um, so, like, if I wanted to, I could just go and volunteer as a lifeguard in Australia? Well, you need to you need to get go through. I, I don't know the specifics, but you need to go through training. Um, you have to get at least uh, this certification of the bronze medallion, which is a uh, you know a swimming competency um, thing, which is from memory much more difficult to attain than uh, you know Red Cross lifeguarding in Australia. So when I worked at camp, that that came up a lot. Um, you know, we had to hire lifeguards. And the general consensus in camping was that you hired Australian lifeguards because they had done more uh, in their training than than most others. So, so what you're saying is, a... I I couldn't do it. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't suggest you just roll up to the beach and uh, volunteer to be a, yeah. a lifeguard. But actually, what you're saying here is, um, sort of makes me even more interested in this concept, right? Because the volunteerism that you that you're talking about here. Um, not only um, is there an element of risk involved, um, but actually there's a lot of um, uh, time and resources uh, that you're putting into it uh, so that you can then go and put yourself at risk on behalf of others, um, all in a volunteer capacity. That's fascinating, right? I mean, that's totally different uh, to my mind from someone who says, this is the job I'm going to have. Right. This is the. This is going to be my business, as okay. opposed to someone uh, who, in this case, says, you know, um, I want to help out, and I'm willing to do a whole bunch of things in order to be eligible to help out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I, I don't want to. I don't want to look down on things that paid firefighters, paid soldiers, things like that do, because certainly they are eminently capable of all kinds of heroic efforts as well. And oftentimes, I think the reason people are attracted to these sorts of professions is because they see the opportunity to take heroic action and they, they often um, ha have some of that selflessness to begin with, that, that desire to um, help others who are in dire straits. But, but yeah, I, I think th these volunteers are just on, on a different level in a sense that um, they have this requirement for themselves. You know, no, nobody's forcing them to do this. Nobody's holding a paycheck over their heads. They just are, are doing it truly. It's coming naturally from them as a result of, you know, the way they look at other people and the way they value them, I guess. Yeah, and before we go on, uh, I think it would be useful for, for the, our listeners and viewers to uh, get your background, Elizabeth. I don't think we introduced what you've done to, to be uh, on the show. Right, yeah. yeah. That's of right. course. Well, um, You're speaking I've, very expertly. <laughs> I, I've been interested in, in uh, heroism and altruism for quite a long time, and um, I'm a science writer by profession. And this fall, I published my first book, which is called "What Makes a Hero: The Surprising Science of Selflessness." And I was lucky lucky enough to get to talk to Matt, to talk to Dr. Phil Zimbardo, to talk to a whole bunch of other researchers who have looked into this idea of uh, where are the origins of selflessness, are they nature, are they nurture, what, what combination of the two, and, and just all these questions that I've been really interested in for a long time. And I, I saw that the research in this area was really beginning to pile up and that there was more and more interest as people were gravitating toward this topic. And so I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool to be in on some of this from the ground up and get to see what these scientists and researchers are up to. Right, right. So, 
you know, it strikes me, um, and, and I should have put more thought into this before we started talking, but, uh, you know, the, this, both of these, um, the, the Lifesavers and the, the Firefighters, it, it, it is sort of that, that pure duty-bound heroism involved, or that, that, that sense of duty, um, and not duty to, like you say, the, an organization or a paycheck, but duty to the community, to the, to, to the people that live around you. You know, um, mm. that, that's, that's what it really comes down to, is the, the Surf Life Saving Clubs, they rely on the community's knowledge that this is an important thing to be done. And, uh, you know, kids start very young going to um, do, these, the, do various trainings and, um, you know, just water awareness sorts of things right from very early on in this the Surf Life Saving Club is part of the community, um, mm. and then and then similarly the the Country Fire Authority. Um, I grew up or spent some time growing up in in a very uh, rural area, very very much the bush, <clears throat> and I remember um, I remember fighting a fire at the at the house next door when I was you know five or six with a bucket, uh, wow. and my dad and all the local you know everyone around had gone to this house. Because there's there's that sense of community, and I think ultimately there's um, with with fire there's a, the idea that if this house goes, then your yours might be next. So obviously you go and help. But there's really uh, it it comes really back down to that base idea of um, serving the, the the community, however big that community is. Right, and it, it's interesting. You know, I think this distinction between whether you get paid or not for your selfless efforts. There was a really interesting study done, it, it was quite a while ago, maybe in the 1970s, but it was basically um, they decided to see, they put out a drive for blood donors and for one of the groups they said, well, we'll pay you a certain amount of money if you come and donate blood. And um, for, for the others, they got a call saying, um, we'd just like for you to come out and donate. Um, you know, we, we just really need some donations right now. But they didn't offer the money. And the interesting thing was that they got a higher response rate from the group to whom they didn't offer money that, than from the group to whom they, they did. And, you know, so it sort of suggests to me that maybe people want to be able to know that they're doing things purely out of the goodness of their heart and you know maybe with the blood donor scenario it feels like too much of a monetary transaction if you're saying okay I'm going in to give my blood and then I'm gonna get paid maybe they prefer to do things like that and not get anything particular in return yeah I think that's yeah that's very interesting I, I just we've, we've talked also about so sort of this this inherent uh, or, or people's impression that there's an inherent heroism in serving, whether it's in the armed forces or uh, police or firefighter, whatever it might be. Um, and we sort of came down on the side, Ari and I did in, in probably a couple of episodes, that um, there's no there's no guarantee of heroism by being in the armed forces, but that the signing up to that might might be considered heroic, knowing that you. Uh, signing up to do something that is risky for the good of others. Um, that part, there's definitely there's definitely something there, but it certainly um, is, is a an, an increased uh, decision if it's if it's volunteer based that that this mm -hmm. this these fires could start any time they could go for any duration, um, and you're certainly giving up. Um, you know, I don't know what the situation was with with these people's jobs. Like, if they're because they're in the firefighters, you know, because they're a firefighter, they're allowed to leave at at any time. Um, but certainly, they're leaving their families, and I mean, you can imagine the families of these uh, these guys and and women that are just running off to fight these wildfires. Um, it, it could be would be very traumatic, I imagine. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think when you have full awareness of what's at stake and what could possibly happen and that that could even include your life, I, I think when that's the case, then certainly I think there there is something heroic in the very act of signing up to put yourself in that position, definitely. 
Yeah, what are you thinking, Ari? Um, you know, I'm I'm recalling these conversations we had um, about uh, military service and firefighters. These go back to some of our very first episodes of the Hero Report, if I remember correctly. Um, and and it seems to me that our position hasn't much changed, right? Um, and which is not that surprising. I never changed my mind. Um, <laughs> but uh, but it is, um, you know, it seems to me this this sort of wrinkle of the volunteerism in Australia. Um, really adds a nice counterpoint and kind of highlights what we've been talking about uh, from from the very beginning of this podcast, right? That um, uh, simply um, simply doing a job, even a risky job, um, doesn't make you necessarily a hero, right? And what what I think we said at the, in those very early podcasts is that uh, it's perhaps the case that an opportunity for heroism um, uh, will arise more. Uh, often for someone who's in that kind of a position, um, but there was this caveat about you know being paid, right? Going to work every day where your job was to um, do something heroic, uh, and here you have people who um, are are um, are choosing uh, not to make it their job, but to simply um, try to help. Yeah, which I think is a, a really interesting um, uh, comparison or, or contrast, I guess I should say. Yeah, I mean, on the other hand, I think sometimes there can be an overlap between these two groups, the, the people who have sort of quote-unquote heroic jobs and the people who do heroic things just because they see somebody else who's in need and they're not expecting anything in re return. When you, when you said that, it made me think of um, what happened after the Boston Marathon bombing attacks here in the United States where um, what you saw when people were getting hurt when the bombs were going off um, oftentimes were people who were spectators just running from the sidelines to help, you know, not there in any official capacity, but a as their day jobs, they were surgeons, they were EMTs, and so a as a result, they had the skill set, they had that, that confidence, and maybe that concern for others that they needed to, to truly step forward when they weren't going to get paid for it. So I think the kind of preparation that you can get in a paid job can equip you to maybe intervene heroically and, and for, for no particular return in, in other situations, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's, I mean, that's kind of where I was expecting the conversation to go. Um, it just, it, it, it's a really uh, very, it's a, a very different culture um, issue, I suppose. Um, one of many that we've been, I've been reminded of, and we've been noticing. <clears throat> um, yeah. So the other thing I wanted to uh, touch on this week, or get into this week, was um, the, the the protests, pretty large protests that are going on in Ukraine and um, Venezuela. Um, what 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 prompted me to want to talk about it was one sort of on the on the street interview with a protester in. Um, Kiev, I think, uh, and the guy, this young guy would have been early twenties probably, um, just said to the camera that he was. I'm not. I'm not going to be able to quote it exactly, but that that he had to he had to do this to get a better life. That um, that death was certainly a possibility, and that that was the price that he was going to that he was willing to pay to make the world the, the world the you know the the country a better place. And I just, I, I don't think that we've ever, I've ever had <clears throat> a conversation about um, heroism involved in protest. And I think it's, um, it's tinged with that, that attitude or that, that idea that one person's hero is another person's terrorist. And uh, I think I'm, I'm interested in sort of getting into whether, whether the act of protesting for your cause at the risk of injury or death uh, the very real risk of injury or death is 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 heroic. Are there any caveats or you know how did that, what are we thinking about protests? Because I don't think we've talked about it. Yeah, no, I don't think we have. Um, but it's a uh, well, it's a natural um, a connection for me anyway um, with you know the work that I've done on human rights. Um, it's it seems to me to be pretty clear. Uh, that we can find lots of, I think, lots of examples of um, human rights activists or advocates um, who are clearly doing something heroic, 
right, in the way that we have talked about heroism for uh, uh, several years now, Matt. Um, so um, uh, where we draw the line, um, uh, you know, you said one man's hero is another man's terrorist. I've always heard freedom fighter and terrorist, not hero, uh, but, uh, yeah, but right. that's interesting. Um, I think that for me anyway, there are very there are some some bright lines uh, that can be drawn there, right? Um, so, um, you know, it seems to me that um, you know going out into the streets to protest um, a, 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 a repressive regime or something um, is uh, you know uh, you know accepting of risk um, and uh, and uh, putting oneself uh, in harm's way potentially uh, making a making a real kind of sacrifice on behalf of um, of others uh, in this case um, the society as a whole and and all the people who are being um, repressed or oppressed by that regime um, I think the the challenge, and maybe this is where you want to head with your uh, comment about the terrorist, um, is when you um, is when you use when you use violence, right? right. Um, and uh, so maybe maybe that's what you have in mind. But um, let's see. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you guys are right. We we definitely have to be careful because when you have this kind of group dynamic, like you you have with a lot of these protests, I I think as human beings, we're susceptible to get so swept up in the forces around us. And, you know, before you end up fighting or dying on behalf of a cause, um, you have to make sure that, you know, you're not taking on this cause just because it's what people around you are enthusiastic about. Um, that, that cause also has to align with, with your own moral compass. And, you know, you talked about caveats. Um, a lot of the officials and soldiers in Germany during World War II um, probably thought that they were doing something heroic. And same thing for uh, the guys who slammed into the World Trade Center um, on 9-11. So if, I, I think if what you stand for involves hurting others who might be innocent people, then you better be really sure about what you're doing before you act. Yeah, I think it, it, that's that's the almost the determining factor, isn't it? The the, the threat of uh, injury or violence. Um, but I mean, violence. I, I'm not sure about violence being an automatic uh, uh, negative. Well, it depends, it's against I guess. whom, right, Matt? The the question is against whom, right? I mean, if you right. if it's or a what? if it's a small if it's a it's it's a group of citizens who are taking on um, the the military establishment that's been repressing them. I think that's very different from a group of um, uh, from a group of people, militants, whatever, um, who are who are blowing up um, restaurants, right? right. Um, oh, uh, you right. know, it seems to me uh, that's so. It's not simply violence as such, right? But it's um, it's it's a question of targeting, um, and and indeed, uh, you know, uh, maybe behind that is a question of goals too, right? Right. Yeah. So the the the, uh, the piece that I didn't mention about this uh, deliberately didn't mention about this guy's interview was that he'd been um, targeted by these by this reporter because he was carrying a box full of Molotov cocktails. Now this that I mean there's you know there's clearly violent intent there, but as you say, Ari, it's sort of it comes down to what's what's the reason or what why is this guy carrying Molotov cocktails? Is it because there are, you know, government snipers and and general general police shooting people. Um, it's really it's a really interesting case, and and obviously, you know, the the reports we see are from from whatever perspective our respective medias want want to uh, want to present it. Um, you know, is is uh, the the freedom fighters in the Ukraine are being presented as the right people, but we generally don't know a whole lot necessarily about what's happening there and even less in Venezuela so mm -hmm. it's it, it all comes down to which which side you you lean on, lean towards right right but but can't we always say i mean maybe i want categorical statements here uh, and maybe you want to resist them and feel free if you do but um, can't we always say that um, you know if your target uh, it, it includes people who are not fighting um, that you're not you're not you're not acting heroically 
right? Um, if you're, you know, if you're shooting at people uh, who have no guns, um, if you're shooting at people not just who have no guns but who aren't involved in um, the thing that you're protesting against, right? Uh, except maybe in some tangential way that, uh, you know, uh, that you'd have to um, really sketch out for somebody, uh, I think you have a problem, right? So, uh, and you can come up with all sorts of um, controversial examples of this, right? Um, the ones that come immediately to mind are South Africa and Israel. Um, but, uh, you know, it seems to me that, that we, can, we can draw some, I, I want anyway to draw some bright lines that targeting um, people who are not involved in the, con in the conflict, um, at, at least I would say not involved in an immediate way. Yeah, I think it's difficult, and there are different shades and, and gray areas. I think sometimes it becomes difficult to draw that bright line. I, I mean, I think about the atomic bombs dropped at the end of the Second World War. Well, you know, a lot of civilians or, you know, children or people that weren't necessarily involved died as a result of those strikes, but then some people will argue, well, many lives were saved because the bomb basically ended the war. So I think sometimes these situations can get very, very complicated. So I, I would, I, I mean, I think oftentimes categorical statements are right m much of the time, but I, I still think we need to consider each situation on an individual basis. And, and you know, I, I do think I, I have a lot of sympathy with the freedom fighters in, in Ukraine. M my gut feeling is that they're doing the right thing here. But, but yeah, there's a lot that we can't see and we only get presented with a certain view of it from the media. So so yeah, it's hard to know what we don't know. Right, but you would, uh, Elizabeth. Let me let me take that example of the bombs because I think it's helpful. Um, you wouldn't say that, um, or oh, maybe you would. Let's see. Would you say that Truman was was Truman a hero for ordering the the bombs being dropped on on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? No, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that that was a heroic act. It may have been what he felt like he had to do, but, but it might have been it might yeah. have been expedient, right? I mean it might have been um, and it might have forwarded the aims uh, that he had and he and you might be able to make an argument yeah. that, you know, killing all these people in Japan meant that you didn't kill certain other people, um, the American oh, yeah. military or what uh, Japanese soldiers. I mean there's all sorts of ways right. that you can talk about it. But yeah. but you know not only but I, but I would say right I wouldn't use the word hero to talk about um, true men who ordered the the bombing and I wouldn't use the word hero to talk about the people uh, flying the planes who actually dropped the bombs right no that, a, that's right I think it was a it was a military objective and they saw that this was a way to fulfill it so that that was kind of an in the line of work type of decision I mean as right. momentous as it was. Yeah, I, I don't personally view that as a heroic act. Now, I would go further, right, and I would say that the second bombing, we can talk about the first bombing some other time maybe, but the second bombing, it seems to me, is really morally problematic, right? Not mm -hmm. simply is it not heroism, but it's morally problematic insofar as it follows very quickly on the heels of the first bombing, um, mm -hmm. and it's, it, you know, there's this, um, there's this requirement of an unconditional surrender uh, in order to, uh, well, and so on and so forth, right? People who we know our history. Um, uh, so it's, it seems to me that um, if we're if we're if we're obliterating uh, civilian targets, first of all, we have a problem, right? And if it's a lot of civilians and some military, I think we still have a problem. Uh, and if we're doing a, a second bombing right away on the heels of the first bombing, and we're demanding something that we're perhaps not likely to accomplish, or and that we don't un ultimately end up accomplishing, even with the second bombing, uh, right. it seems to me we're in we're in real um, uh, morally muddy waters there, or maybe not muddy, right? Maybe clearly. Yeah. Uh, we have a moral problem there. So, um, and I think all of that boils down to the fact that there's so many civilian casualties here, um, and uh, and that part of the objective is we have these civilian casualties, and that will force the government um, to to this military end, and thereby it'll bring the war to a swift close, and it will save military lives. Right. <laughs> exactly. So it then becomes a question of well whose lives are you going to value more highly? And, I mean, I, when I'm confronted with questions like that, I, I just don't even know how to answer. So, yeah, I, I think certainly that second bomb was a very problematic decision and s something else probably should have been done at that point. I'm not sure exactly what, but, yeah, I, I wish we could take that back. That's the first time you've ever thought about that situation, right, Ari? Uh, yeah, you've never... <laughs> 
<laughs> I've never trotted it out in a class before. <laughs> so I think we're, we've, we, we, we got into, which is just the obvious way to, place to go, but into the idea of which side is right or which side or action is wrong. Right. But I, I want to get back into that, that, I guess, that individual decision on the part of all of these protesters to say, I'm going to, you know, it's worth risking my life, my, my well-being to improve this country. And, you know, I've seen a lot of people saying, well, it's, you know, it's, these, it, it's desperation. It's people who are um, living in abject poverty that are rising up in the streets. But that's not really the case. It's it's the and and this seems to be what happens in a lot of protests. Is it's the students or the um, the educated uh, classes that are that are protesting, and they have got plenty to lose, right? They they they're not living in poverty. They're living with in in sort of the middle classes, um, but still, uh, and and we can dis discuss whether it's purely an individual decision or whether it's being swept up into a movement, but. They have to make that decision to go out into that square, um, and we've seen, you know, over the last couple of years, just seen this all across the world, where where young, educated people are risking their lives and their their health uh, mm -hmm. for a cause, for a, for a for a better country. Yeah, and I think that that's one example how sometimes um, group dynamics being cognizant of what people around you are doing, what they're fighting for. So sometimes that can, I think, bring out the best in, in human nature. I think, you, you know, in Ukraine you see the protesters being inspired um, by the actions of those around them, and that helps sort of propel them to their own self-sacrifice. They're kind of be being carried along in a certain sense on the wave of this larger movement that's going on. But then at the same time, it's also this very important individual decision that they make to commit themselves to this cause. I imagine there's a lot of voters over there doing this, right? Yeah, I, I think one, one of the groups is even called uh, Svoboda that I read about in a newspaper article. It, it means freedom in a number of different uh, Slavic languages. So I never used to like my name as a kid because, you know, every elementary school teacher would mispronounce it and <laughs> People would be like, well, what is that? How do you spell that? But n now I, I love it because I can see the significance of it. And, yeah, n now I think it's a cool name. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, Matt, we'll, we'll have to go back through the Hero Report archives. Um, did, we never, did we not talk about this sort of thing uh, during, like, the Arab Spring protests and uh, all the stuff going on in Egypt and, and so on? Did we really not talk about any of this? I really don't think so. I think that yeah. somehow we uh, we skipped over all of that. That's terrible. <laughs> yeah. Um, because obviously, I mean, you know, a lot of what we're saying here uh, has, um, you know, uh, I, I would have thought would have been repetitive um, uh, from from what we would have talked about um, uh, back in 2011 or or, or 2012. Um, so, uh, you know. I, I don't know. I mean, I think that what you're what you're saying is really uh, is really fascinating, right? This kind of um, calculus that that people have to make, um, and and I think that you know that to me really kind of points to the um, the at least potentially heroic um, action that people are taking to go out into the streets and um, and protest something, right? Uh, this 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 calculation of of the potential risk and and uh, you know and and the idea that um, on the one hand, there is this risk that we have to take into account, but on the other hand, um, uh, the the alternative, not doing anything, uh, seems to to so many people to be um, almost impossible, right? Which is something we hear from people who take heroic action all the time. I couldn't, but I couldn't do anything but this. Right. Right. Well, I read. Uh, I was reading a discussion on on this. Uh, I think it was on on Reddit where. Someone said, "What would what would it what do you think it would take for uh, people in America to do this?" Um, and I think, you know, there's that there's numerous groups of people who think we're basically living through, or we, not me anymore, living through, uh, you know, the second coming of Nazi Germany in in the U.S. But but the, you know, in the, in reality, what would it take to get 
students to get people out on the street at at the the with the risk of that real mortal danger. And I think I guess you could you could ask the question of how many people would have been at Occupy Wall Street or Occupy around the country um, if there'd been you know live ammunition. There was certainly there was certainly uh, plenty of police brutality during those uh, those protests, and and so there is an element of risk in going out to be part of it. But no one was getting shot, and I, I wonder, um, you know, is this a is this a cultural thing? I mean, certainly. Ukraine. Anyone living there has been through various uh, movements in in the last 50, 60, 70 years. They've they've been through a lot. Um, I wonder if it's a cultural thing. What 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 do you guys think would it would look like in the U.S.? Well, I mean, cer certainly during the civil rights era, you saw a lot of people here in the U.S. that were willing to stand up for their cause against all odds and they knew that sometimes they would be facing great danger and police brutality. So I, I think it's certainly possible. I think it would require probably a lot of solidarity um, among the group of people that are doing this. It's hard for me to imagine a single person alone having the kind of fortitude that would be needed to carry a cause this, this big. I think there has to be a lot of um, unity within the, the group that's protesting and I think that, that's what we're seeing in Ukraine and I think it's possible here in U the US. I, I can't say it, exactly what it would take. Honestly it's a bit hard for me to to picture people going to this length but I hope that it, if it's ever required that people will rise to the challenge. Well I think and, and, yeah, any popular rising like that where there was I don't know whether where where there were armed police involved. Um, there'd certainly be a lot more guns on the side of the protesters than there would be in in the Ukraine or Venezuela, right? It would be, it would it would degrade very quickly potentially. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly could could. It would be a very volatile type of situation. So yeah, you, you would have to be aware of exactly what you're getting into, and and do you believe in this cause? enough that you'd be willing to die for it and I think anyone who would be involved in something like that in the US would have to genuinely ask themselves that question and with the Occupy Wall Street people I, I don't know I don't know how far they would be willing to go L luckily it hasn't really come up yet right. but we'll see you know it'll be interesting to see how things play out over the next 10 or 20 years if as they say that the middle class here in the US is continuing to decline there may be some very interesting developments as a result of that. Yeah. Well, um, I think we could transition again here. We wanted to briefly uh, introduce our speakers to the, the announcement, I guess, that um, we have uh, Daniel Ellsberg coming to the Hero Roundtable this year to speak. And Yay. I think that's... Uh, I'm very, very excited about that because it's such a topical... Um, subject at the you know such a current topic, uh, the, the idea of whistleblowers and and I wonder if you guys can share with with me because I'm not there anymore. But what you know the last couple of months, what has the the general story around uh, Edward Snowden become? Is it, it has it changed the general? You know I mean that's yeah. How, how is how is Snowden being being viewed in the U.S. right now? Or, or is he at all? Yeah, the easy answer is who? <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, now if you you know if you're like um, you know if you spend time on 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 Twitter or on Reddit or whatever, I bet you hear a lot about Snowden and the NSA and um, you know if you follow Glenn Greenwald um, on Twitter, you you hear tons about this. And if you're if you're paying attention to people who pay attention to um, global affairs and foreign policy. You're probably um, you're probably getting plenty of this um, every day, but um, I think the number of people for whom those things are true uh, is, is very very small. Yeah, I mean, I think when you ask people, like when they have gone out and, and surveyed the general American population, that there is a lot of sympathy for Snowden, really. But the degree to which people care, to which large numbers of people care. It's hard for me 
to assess. Like, I, I don't think people are growing overly paranoid. Like, definitely the, um, the NSA is kind of in the, the doghouse right now, but um, in, in as far as people see themselves, it, their individual lives as vulnerable to, you know, spying or, or these kinds of intrusions, I, I don't know. Like, I, I don't feel like it's going to become a, a huge popular movement that a large portion of the United States is involved in. Yeah. And it, so then it makes you wonder, um, you know, if he thinks it was worth worth exile, worth the risk. Because, um, I, I mean, I think, it, again, it, it sort of depends, like you said, Rari, it depends on who you listen to. So, you know, he, he may may think that that's done huge, uh, huge things in the U.S., started the conversation, whatever, whatever it might be, but it does come down to the general population, and, and they're the ones that vote, and they're the ones that uh, spend their money, and et cetera, et cetera, and they're not, they're just not that interested. So how do you, how do you, uh, you know, going back to the civil rights movement, how do you make um, an effective cultural change these days if it's not, you know, Snowden wasn't able to do anything, anything major. Um, how you know? How would you, how would you make make big change these days to be a, a, a hero of civil rights or human rights? Okay, so the easy answer is there's no movement. Um, you know, um, the the Snowden NSA revelations that was all media. Right? It it was it was all it it was all mediated. It went through the media. Um, you had to be paying attention to certain media at at a particular time. And the news cycle is so fast today um, that without a movement, without people um, uh, keeping these things in the news, without um, marches and protests and um, uh, you know um, leadership and so on. Uh, the, it simply can't make a mark. It can't endure. Um, you know, I mean, it, I I don't know. I don't know if that I'll say it doesn't matter how big the issue or how serious the issue. Maybe it does. Um, but this seemed like a fairly big, fairly serious issue that um, caught on for um, I don't know a few weeks <laughs> and uh, and then ran out of steam. Because yeah. there were other things, funnier things, cat videos, um, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Uh, people's attention, the the competition for people's attention and interest um, is just too is is just way too much. Um, yeah. And so the notion that that you could um, accomplish some great political um, end uh, without um, without a real movement, a grassroots movement, something that that's built to endure. Um, I, I think it's impossible. Yeah, I mean, I think that Snowden and Greenwald had a good strategy in that they sort of trickled out the knowledge that they had. They, they didn't just drop it all at once. Um, you know, different stories appeared at, at different points in time, and so in some sense there was an ongoing dialogue because there was a steady drip, drip, drip of new revelations, but but yeah, then, then the question is, well, when when Snowden runs out of stuff, where does it go? You, you know, as you say, I don't really see the general population picking this up and, and running with it and turning it into any kind of grassroots thing. So it, it's hard to say. Like, I, I, I hope that this issue doesn't get buried because I think it's a really important issue and one that impacts all of our lives, whether we totally realize it or not. But it, honestly, I'm not too... Optimistic at this point, I guess we'll we'll just have to see. So, if if you wanted to change something, something culturally, something um, policy wise, and you wanted to be the hero of that change, how would you do it in today's world? Because mm -hmm. of that, you you do have that attention deficit. That that I mean, you know, the Super Bowl ads connect the whole country. But they're forgotten after three days. So, I mean, that's that's the world we're living in. So, how do you make? How do you change things? Or yeah, I, mean, I think it's always going to be that uphill battle for people's attention, and especially in this day and age when you can access anything you want on the internet at any time of the day or night. There, there are just so many things competing for our 
attention. And I know, um, you know, D Dr. Zimbardo is always trying to get interest in her his heroic imagination project, and and people are interested. But the problem is, they're all also interested in so many other things. And so I think that those of us who have causes that we're advocating for, we we have to face that this is the reality. And so does that mean we have to be making a huge splash in the media all the time? Well, I, I don't necessarily think that's the way to, to go because that, that doesn't necessarily sustain itself. But as to what, what to do instead, well, that, that's, that's a very good question. That, that's like the $1,000 question. I, I don't know. Yeah, like I wonder, uh, one cause that's, that's in, the, in the news a lot at the moment is gay marriage. And I wonder mm -hmm. if there, well, not wonder, but there, do, there just doesn't seem to be a Martin Luther King in that movement, right? It's it is grassroots, mm -hmm. and so I wonder if the if we're going to have any more of these cultural heroes, like a um, you know these these freedom fighter uh, individuals who lead the charge. Do you do you think that there's room for that anymore? Well, well, I think with an issue like gay marriage, perhaps it doesn't lend itself. So much to their their being the one hero, like the the Caesar Chavez or the Martin Luther King type of figure. And, and I think one of the cool things about this movement is um, people can see how it pertains to the lives of the people they know. And, and enough people, gay people, are out and proud these days that most of us, you know, we're friends with them. We we can understand just intuitively how how this is going to change their lives and so I, I think it's wonderful that it's a movement of just regular people that thousands and thousands of them and I don't think there necessarily has to be one voice that stands out as long as there is the strong grassroots push. Yeah. What do you think Ari? We've lost you Ari, there's no no voice. Uh oh. <laughs> We've lost him. I think I think you just came in. Okay. <laughs> no, no, he didn't. Um, while he works out his volume, we'll, um, I, do you think there are any causes where that, where that is even possible? I mean, there's a lot of environmental causes um, at the moment, or what? You know, it sort of all falls under the big umbrella of climate change. And they, and again, I don't know that there's, if we, let, let's say, climate change is addressed in in a you know, an effective way. Do you think in 20 years um, there's there's the possibility of an individual being remembered as the one who led that? Well, the the first name that comes to mind, of course, is Al Gore. But um, yeah, other than that, I don't know if we have any big standard bearers. I, I think Al Gore has probably done may, maybe more than anyone else here in the U.S. just to to publicize the cause and. I think as a result of his efforts, the population at large here is at least aware that this is an issue. Of course, that there's the ongoing debate as to, you know, wh whether or not this is legitimate and man cause. I, I mean, I think all the scientists, of course, are on, on one side, and so some of the rest of the population is on the other. But at, at least it's being discussed, and I, I think people are aware that this is something that's looming. And I think you have more people questioning now when there are things like the polar vortex weather event here in the US people are asking themselves well you know we've had so many extreme weather events recently in the past few years not not just one of these events but when you look at all of them together it, is that a sign that something is I indeed happening so i, I think that it, it's on people's radar screen and sometimes that's maybe the most that some of these advocates can do is just get get these issues on people's radar screen because that's necessary before we can decide as a society to do something intelligent about them. Yeah, well, and Ari's typing to me now saying uh, that, <laughs> that the big part involved here is the, is the organizations behind these people. I mean, Martin Luther King had a large group, a large team of people working with him to make that change, um, mm -hmm. and that today that's, that's the way to do it, that, there's, that, that there are big organizations working on these issues today. Um, so I wonder, you know, it's that, I mean, I, I'm asking the question because I think we, a lot of people, uh, when asked who a hero is or who their hero is, they, they mention these people that have, that are the figureheads of cultural change. So I, I, yeah. you know, it's hard, and maybe people, I don't know, I, I wonder if people saw those people as, you know, the general populace saw these 
cultural heroes as the leaders, as the heroes of these movements at the time. Um, because I just don't, I don't see a whole lot of them. I don't see it working that way, maybe anymore. Yeah, I mean, I think it's something that sometimes the heroes are easier to see in retrospect when we have 10 years, 20 years distance away from the beginning of the movement. So, so, so that's one thing. But I, I think, yeah, th th this is probably what um, Dr. Zimbardo would call social heroes, which are very distinct, of course, from the traditional physical hero that's usually lauded in myths and stories and... Um, in the hero's journey type Hollywood uh, narrative. So I think, you know, maybe there's a little bit more reluctance w with these social heroes to truly regard them as heroes, but I think I, I definitely regard that as a, a form of heroism that should be recognized probably more than it is today. I think a, a lot of people have this idea that if people don't fit a certain heroic mold or, or look a certain way or come from a certain background, well, that, that's not a real hero, but... You know, you know, I love the idea that Dr. Zimardo has of democratizing heroism and um, m making it accessible and also recognizing it in all its different incarnations. Right, right. Well, we are uh, coming up on our hour here, so Ari's still not working with the microphone. Um, you knew so something had I... to happen at the end of the day here. I, I was like, everything's going so well, so something's going to happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> He went to the other side of the house and uh, lost his microphone. So, uh, Elizabeth, thanks very much for being part of this again. Um, we're really looking forward to you being part of the Hero Roundtable again this year on the, the main stage sharing your research and, and stories. Um, so yeah. thank you very much for having us, or for, for having us have you, I guess. Um, <laughs> well, you yeah, got any last you. thoughts to, to leave us with? Well, yeah, just, just um, thanks again for having me. I can't wait for, for this year's Hero Roundtable and, you know, t talking about the grassroots effort. I, I think the Hero Roundtable, um, we started to form this great community of people that can become grassroots advocates for for everyday heroism. And I, I think that that's a movement that's going to continue with, with this coming year's Hero Roundtable, and so I can't wait. Great. Well, um, we... Uh... <laughs> Ari wants to know what uh, what's going to happen in March because it's March here in February there. Somehow uh -huh. we've, I think we've done that. We did that for last month as well. We were <laughs> at the end of the the month. So um, I mean, so far March and Saturday looks good. Ari, I would definitely plan on uh, being part of it. So thanks again, Elizabeth, and uh, we'll see all of our viewers and uh, listeners next week. And Ari says goodbye. All right. Bye bye. <laughs>